This episode of Musical Hell is brought to you by Midnight Musicals. Welcome to the podcast Musical Underground. Thank you. Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and marketable intellectual property. Every so often, you get a movie that, on the surface level, is a callous attempt to wring some extra money out of a pre-existing IP, a toy line perhaps, or a theme park ride, but the movie itself turns out to be rather good, finding a way to tell an entertaining story through the fabricated lens it has been given. The problem is that this means the movie is usually very successful as a result, meaning that producers start scrambling for similar properties they can turn into blockbuster movies. And the results are seldom as good. Take, for example, our next offender, the Playmobil movie. Let's face it, there is one reason why this movie exists. Actually, there are 468.1 million reasons, that being the dollar amount raked in by the Lego movie worldwide. But even then, it's struggled to find a studio, as the initial pitch with writer-director Bob Persichetti fell through with Sony. Persichetti would go on to do the first Spider-Verse movie with them, once again proving that it is a rare bad movie that does not blow some good. Eventually, the project landed in the lap of On Animation and Open Road Films, who delivered it into theaters in 2019 with a resounding splat, having the worst opening weekend for a release of its size. And now, it lands in my court. So let's examine the case of the Playmobil movie. Our main character is Marla, an 18-year-old girl who's preparing to ask her parents to let her take a gap year and see the world rather than going straight to college, a plan she confides to her 6-year-old brother, Charlie. I'm Marla. I'm going to backpack around the world and have lots of adventures and be a privileged white girl. Yay! See, Marla has the first world problem of having parents who have given her everything she needs in life, and she wants challenge and adventure. She also has our first sin, her I Want song, So Much World. La la la, everything is awesome, but in a way where Lego won't sue us. La la la. Anna Taylor-Joy has a decent voice, and she's doing her best with what she's given. I'd like to see her in a proper musical. But the number is mixed badly, it sounds like she's singing to a YouTube karaoke track, and it doesn't have the invigorating quality you want from a song like this. It's more like what would happen if you fed Steven Schwartz's entire catalog into an AI and asked it to produce an upbeat number. Marla and Charlie are having so much fun playing Playmobil Knights and Vikings that they don't notice it's well past Charlie's bedtime, and also, rather ominously, well past the time when their parents should be home. Ms. Brenner, I'm a solemn-looking police officer. There's been an accident. Well, on the plus side, Marla did ask for a challenge. Fast forward to four years later, with Marla and Charlie somehow managing to still live in their suburban split level on her fast food service job salary. Marla's passport now exists only as a poignant reminder of her shattered dreams and, frankly, much cooler hairstyle. Worse, her relationship with Charlie is noticeably strained, and he rebels against her new authority, sneaking out of his bedroom to go play Playmobil with his friends. Charlie gets distracted by a giant toy dinosaur and decides to take a brief detour following it to the convention hall it's being taken to. Fortunately, Marla has a tracking app and is able to locate Charlie in midtown Manhattan, pleading her way past the security guard to find him in what the music would have us believe is an impressive model city. You used to be fun, but now you're not! That's because I grew up and learned life's not fun! Wah! Sin number two. I have a big problem with how this movie handles its own inciting incident. Marla and Charlie's parents died. This in and of itself is deeply traumatic, but it has also forced Marla to be the sole caregiver for her underage sibling, a responsibility she did not expect and certainly was unprepared for. Of course her priorities have realigned. She now has to worry about things like bills and groceries and not trespassing in convention centers. Meanwhile, Charlie is all, what happened to you? You used to be cool. As if Marla losing her wanderlust was some kind of personal failing and not the consequence of a devastating life event. 
Throughout this case, it will become clear that the Playmobil movie is poorly mimicking much better films, in this case Lilo and Stitch, which also centered on siblings orphaned in an accident and the elder taking on the role of surrogate parent. That movie explored the complicated dynamics between Nani and Lilo, recognized the difficulty of Nani's situation and her fear of failing her sister, and the very real consequences if she did fail. This movie just has Marla and Charlie flinging trite aphorisms at one another. The fight escalates until Marla tosses away Charlie's beloved Viking figure, which somehow shorts all the power and causes the lighthouse at the center of the display to go all magical levitating vortex. The lighthouse zaps Marla and Charlie into Playmobil world, and Marla has a mild freakout over the body horror that results. Oh no, I've lost half my joints and can't stand or walk! This will never be a problem after this one scene! Which makes this a good time to discuss sin number three, which is that Playmobil itself isn't a very inspiring topic for a movie, even by the standards of childhood nostalgia cash-ins. It's certainly a recognizable brand, but it doesn't loom large in the pop culture consciousness on the same level as Lego, Barbie, or even Transformers. They're just kind of there, and this movie isn't selling anyone on the idea that they're a wellspring of boundless imagination and play. Especially since everything looks so... meh. One of the big things that made the Lego movie and its successors work is that it fully commits to the Lego aesthetic. Everything from the shapes and textures of the setting, to the way the characters move, to little details like Benny's broken helmet. The limitations of the medium never feel like limitations. In fact, they're intrinsic to the unique style of the movie. It looks and feels like something that might be concocted by a kid playing with Legos which it ultimately reveals is exactly what's happening. Apart from the general design of the characters and some of the set pieces, nothing in the Playmobil movie really looks or feels uniquely Playmobil, and nothing about the story does either. And the fact that the phrase uniquely Playmobil doesn't conjure up a whole lot of ideas to begin with shows that this was a bad idea from the start. Despite not having things like knees or fingers, Marla is still basically Marla, but Charlie has fused with his Viking figurine and is pretty thrilled to discover he's a super strong badass warrior, especially when they get caught in the middle of a raid and he has a grand time flinging barbarians around. Woohoo! Bloody Conquest rocks! Yay! The leader of the Vikings immediately declares a feast in Charlie's honor, but unfortunately a group of pirates has witnessed the whole thing, and they receive a call from a Roman emperor on their futuristic wrist radio demanding the strongest and fiercest warriors to fight for his gladiatorial arena. And that sentence made it perfectly clear that the writers looked at the mishmash of characters and motifs in the Lego movie and said, what if we did that, but in a way that doesn't actually work? Marla is itching to get back home and has no time for Vikings and their not really historically accurate sexism. And I have no time for the dumb warrior song that results, especially when it morphs into a bad semi-song argument between Charlie and his sister. You suck, Marla! Slaughtering enemies is fun! Charlie catapults himself away from his sister and right into the path of the pirates. The flight also knocks him out, making his kidnapping easy and sparing the trouble of writing a plot arc. Marla pursues her brother on horse and is able to see him loaded into the pirate's wagon, but almost loses them on the multidimensional highway. After a chase scene involving a dog sled, get used to the randomness, it isn't going to get any better, she ends up hijacking a janky food truck driven by a man named Dell, who I fear is the officially designated buddy for this road trip. Hi, I'm Dell. I suck at life. Unfortunately, the pirate wagon has a cloaking device. I wasn't lying about the randomness. So Marla loses track of it, and Dell wrests control of his vehicle away from her and dumps her by the side of the road. Marla is miserable. She's lost her brother. She's confused by the nonsensical universe she's been thrust into. Relatable. And even her horse doesn't want anything to do with her. Also relatable. So she's forced to trek through a wily coyote landscape into Frontierland. Arr, ominous glower. Feels like either a Muse or Lindsay Sterling video is about to break out. Dell is here too, getting yelled at by one of the locals for selling enchanted hay that's turning the horses fabulous. 
See, Dell is kind of a laid-back rogue who tools around in his battered vehicle, doing jobs of questionable legitimacy, and who is deep in debt to a crime lord named Glenara, and basically he's Han Solo without the charm or style. Right down to the belligerent sexual tension with the heroine. I make fun of you to satisfy my fragile ego. I put up with you because I have no other options. Marla attempts to rustle up a posse to search for her brother, but doesn't get very far. Fortunately, she managed to snag two gold coins from the Vikings, which gets the locals' attention. Unfortunately, it's the wrong kind of attention, as they're drawn to her like zombies to Neil deGrasse Tyson, forcing her to fight her way out. Give me all your gold, boogity boogity! Oh, my genitals! Whoa, Playmobil guy's got nards! Dell, who is also interested in the gold, manages to rescue Marla and they escape Frontierland, apparently the cowboys are confined to their own zone, and proceeds to be an absolute dick throughout the ensuing ride. You were awesome back there, but I can't admit it because of my fragile ego. Would you mind giving me all your gold? Marla isn't much better, as she vastly inflates the amount of gold she has to convince Dell to help her find Charlie. At which point they have to swerve to avoid some migrating triceratops, and let's see what Charlie's up to, shall we? I'm locked in a cage. This sucks. Charlie's locked up alongside a pirate, an Amazon warrior with a borderline offensive accent, some kind of futuristic cyborg alien person, and a caveman who speaks entirely in caveman grunts. And we get our first real look at our villain, Emperor Maximus. Look at me! I'm childish fey and evil! Charlie is all, my brand new Viking friends will save me! But Maximus isn't phased, as his kingdom is located on a remote island with guards and rocky cliffs and what have you. Woo! Are you ready to have some fun? More than ready, but I'm guessing we're going to get your lame-ass villain song instead. La la la, my subjects love it when people get eaten in front of them. If nothing else, the voice cast is putting in an effort. Adam Lambert is dialing the ham up to 11 here. But this is pretty generic as far as villain songs go, what with the sinister lyrics over wordless vocals and a prominent forebeat. Even the music in this sounds like a half-hearted echo of much better ideas. I'm all for an anthem in tribute to the bread and circuses method of tyranny, but still, try harder. Elsewhere, Marla and Dell have wound up in some metropolis or another, where Dell claims to know a super suave secret agent by the name of Rex Dasher. I'm Rex Dasher. I'm every British spy parody, and I have my own theme music. Speaking of hardworking actors, at least Daniel Radcliffe got a transphobia-free paycheck out of this mess. Rex reveals what we already know. People have been going missing. The same people who took Charlie are probably responsible, yada yada. He then takes them to a flower shop, which is a front for an evil organization called Skull which stands for a nonsensical phrase designed to backronym into the word skull, which has a super powerful satellite array which can provide them with surveillance footage of the earlier chase. But to get it, they have to enact a zany scheme where Marla impersonates skull scientist Dr. Greta Grimm, while Dell doses the real Dr. Grimm with sleeping drop-laced breakfast burritos. Or he would if he weren't thwarted by a childproof cap drugging himself in the process. I am the real Dr. Grimm. You can tell by my facial hair, which all Eastern European women have. Rex manages to save the day, helping Marla upload the footage before jumping out the back to take a shortcut to the third act via being drugged and kidnapped by more pirates. Dell and Marla take a break at a truck stop outside the pyramids. I hate the sentences this movie is making me say. Where Marla reaches another dead end as the wagon just seems to vanish into thin air. This leaves her frustrated and deeply worried about her brother, and Dell's comic relief isn't helping. Look, Marla, I'm tempting you with food and discovering the joy of cooking. The brief attempt at bonding is interrupted when Dell recognizes a logo on the wagon's bumper, which leads them to a futuristic sci fi region. The logo belongs to Glenara, who Dell hopes to pay off with the money Marla promised him. Marla tries to explain she doesn't exactly have the money, but Dell is firmly in refusing to let basic communication interfere with the plot mode. Good thing Marla does a kindness to Glenara's servant Robotatron, ensuring a helpful buddy in a tight spot. And it turns out Glenara is as much of a bad Jabba the Hutt knockoff as Dell is a bad Han Solo knockoff. Where's my money, Dell? Ooh, is this a gold coin behind your ear? Ooh, shiny! You see what I mean? You think Jabba would have been impressed by the coin behind the ear trick? Bet she doesn't even have a trap door leading to a monster pit. 
The two gold coins are enough to get Glenara to spill that she sold the cloaking devices to Maximus, and that his prisoners are due to be Colosseum fodder the following evening. Unfortunately, at this point, Marla is finally forced to reveal she's out of gold, so while she and Del get surrounded by thugs, let's go back to Charlie, who has joined forces with his other prisoners in an escape attempt. Phew, we're out! Thank goodness the alien had long electro tentacles under its helmet we didn't know about until now and which will never come up again! Huh, apparently alien person could have just knocked out their captors at any time. And it didn't even have to be funny. They manage to make it to the harbor and Pirate Guy's ship, but Pirate Guy gets knocked out mid-musical number. The others nominate Charlie acting captain, as Vikings are also pretty good at the whole nautical thing. Charlie's in way over his head, but he does his best, and doesn't do half bad apart from forgetting the important step of untying from the dock. Oh, that almost worked. Anyway, back to Marla and Del, who Glenara is about to execute by teleporting them into a volcano. But Robotatron steps in to kind of save the day by holding on to them long enough to switch the Stargate settings to a more hospitable fairy tale forest. Del is pissy about Marla lying to him, and even her very valid point that he wouldn't have helped her for altruistic reasons doesn't faze him. You suck, Marla! You ruin everything! Oh no, don't leave me! Oh no, no third act despair! Oh! First of all, why does Marla care what Del thinks about her? Second, why are we acting like she's the one who's at fault in this whole business? Charlie was the one who ran away, and nothing that's happened to her since can reasonably be considered the consequences of her attitude. What kind of lesson is she supposed to be learning here? To regain her wonder and sense of adventure? Because she doesn't seem particularly resistant to that, and anyway, this seems like a bad place to inspire it. Marla, and for that matter Charlie, hasn't really learned or changed much over the course of this story, and since they've spent most of it apart, they're certainly not developing their relationship with each other. While Marla and the somewhat busted Robotatron try to make their way to a nearby castle, Maximus has his prisoners in the stocks and is gloating over them, which pretty much puts the damper on Charlie's taste for adventure. And hey, Rex Dasher has finally worked his way back into the plot. Hello, Charlie. I'm here to tell you your sister has been doing awesome things you never dreamed she could do in a scene we absolutely ripped off Finding Nemo. Learning Marla is on the way gives Charlie the strength to break out of the stocks, but midway through the ensuing chase, he decides he needs to stay behind and sacrifice himself to save his friends for no discernible reason. Meanwhile, Marla is so hopelessly lost that she's forced to resort to one of the oldest gags in existence. Oh, things could not possibly get any worse. <laughs> fit of anger, Marla throws away her symbolic passport, hitting a nearby fairy godmother in the eye. Convenient. Said fairy godmother does grant wishes, but only in a way that allows her to make generalized statements about self-esteem and believing in yourself or whatever. Always look on the bright side of life. Da -da. Da -da 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 -da. Again, are we just going to keep ignoring the fact that Marla's parents are dead? Shouldn't she be dealing with something related to processing grief and making the most of life even when it doesn't go as you planned or something like that? Sin number eight for this helping of dumb generic affirmations. With a fancy dress, a backpack full of armor, and a magic carpet ride, Marla makes her way to Maximus' city of Constantinopolis. She manages to get into the Colosseum via more convenience, including a decoy hologram thing that Rex Dasher was using, and maybe he gave one to her, I don't know, I'm not even bothering to check at this point, and is just in time to see Charlie ushered into the arena and shackled for his fight with some mysterious, terrifying, vicious monster. Maximus isn't bothered too much by the arrival of a new challenger, and he announces they will now both face the terrifying, horrible, dragged-from-the-depths-of-here creature he holds captive for the sole purpose of fighting and devouring the mightiest of warriors. Rawr. <laughs> I mean, you're kidding, right? This is their big boss battle? He looks like the gay cousin of Rex from Toy Story. He makes Dinosaur Train look like the Rite of Spring sequence from Fantasia. <laughs> as absolutely not scary as the dinosaur is, he manages to corner Marla and Charlie until Del comes in for his change of heart rescue. See, it turns out the fairy godmother gave him a bunch of breakfast burritos, which he sold to pay off Glenara and... <laughs> 
Right. The important thing is he still has some of that enchanted pink hay in the back, and Charlie and Marley use the power of sibling teamwork to get it down the T-Rex's throat. Wendy, I can fly! Maximus is quickly taken care of as the supporting cast took out the guards while we weren't looking, and they promptly toss him into prison. Marla frees the dinosaur, and after a bit of I'll miss you most of all, Scarecrow, she and Charlie ride it back to the lighthouse. Ooh, look, Marla, a montage of all the locations we've been to. Ooh. It's kind of like the final sequence in the never-ending story, only we didn't care about any of these places the first time. Charlie and Marla get zapped back into the real world, where they find out the Playmobil universe runs on Narnia time and only five minutes have passed. And Marla's passport now has stamps from all the places they visited, which is good since she's still supporting herself and her brother on a minimum wage job, so international travel is probably going to be off the table for a while. Along with higher education, home ownership, good medical care, retirement benefits, and how exactly are they better off and this is a happy ending again? We turned into toys for an hour and it solved all our problems! Yay! been several movies in recent years where characters travel through a series of varied yet interconnected worlds. Movies filled with visual creativity, memorable and well-developed characters, solid plotting, and inspiring messages. This is definitely not one of those movies. Much like Playmobil itself, it feels like a poor substitute for the much cooler toys you could be playing with. So the Court of Musical Hell condemns the producers to receive nothing but cheap dollar store knockoffs of all their favorite brands. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court and Musical Hell is now adjourned. Hi everybody, the cast for this reenactment cost me about $20, which is more than the yearly amount many actors get paid in residuals by streaming services. If you want to help fight studios more interested in YouTube reviews than paying their actors, consider donating to the Entertainment Community Fund. That's where the Patreon profits for this episode are going. Thank you!